Welcome guys. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about sound and light waves and more particularly about how they interact with themselves and interact with their surrounding environments. So to begin, let's talk about how waves in general act with one another. Um, and we see two really two main ways of, for waves to interact with one another. One of those is constructively and the other is destructively. And from their names, we can kind of infer a lot of what's going on with the two. Uh, constructive interference is going to look something like this. Um, you'll see uh, wave one right here and wave two. And if we add those two together, it produces a wave much larger in size. Uh, this is the book says waves combine without any phase difference when they oscillate together. In other words, they're in phase. So what we mean by that, if we look at wave one, we see it's cresting right here. And we see that wave two is also cresting. Because of this, if these two waves interacted or came into contact with one another, they'd produce a wave that was literally double the original two waves. And this works proportionally to whatever size waves you have here. But in order for that to happen, you have to have the waves perfectly in phase. If we look at these pictures here, once again, we've got wave one, wave two, producing a, a larger wave here. Now, this, of course, is with our transverse waves. But if we look at something that looks with, like a longitudinal wave, remember, we see our series of compressions and series of rarefactions. So wave one is right here. Wave two is here. What we see is kind of the increase in intensity or amplitude. Uh, amplitude was pretty easy to see here, you know, the area from the crest, but here amplitude is represented by how close together your compressions, and we see that these guys are much closer than they originally appeared over here. So increase in amplitude, increased in energy, perfect constructive interference. On the other hand, we have what we call destructive interference, which is the exact opposite. This time our two waves, okay, wave one, wave two, are destructively interfering. They're producing a wave that's actually smaller, and we, this would what it be right here. These dotted lines are representing what should have been there, but this is the result. If we look at it longitudinally, we see that here were our compressions here. Notice they're not in the same spot in wave two as they are in wave one, and as a result, we have something that seems completely out of phase and absolute mess. No intensity or increase in intensity there. Now, if we begin to look at how light and sound can interact with other objects, not just themselves, we're going to deal with some words that can become confusing. Those three words are reflection, refraction, and diffraction. They're incredibly confusing, not because of their definitions, but because they all sound the same. So the goal here is for you to become familiar with those words, and hopefully by the end of it you'll be able to somewhat identify them. Not be experts again, just be familiar with them. So let's start with reflection. This is something that you guys see all the time. You look into a mirror and what happens? The light bounces off the mirror and eventually returns to the person's eye. That's my eye, by the way. All right. So waves can reflect. Some sounds can reflect, which produces our echoes. And they obey what's called the law of reflection. And the law of reflection is really demonstrated well with this picture. It says that whatever angle the light comes in at, or what we call the incident ray, and we can call this our incident angle, it will reflect at that same angle. We call that a reflected ray and our reflected angle. So let's say it came in at 35 degrees to the normal, and the normal is what we call the line that is perfect, perfectly perpendicular to the surface of the mirror. It's going to exit at 35 degrees. Hence the reason you can only see certain objects when you look in a mirror if they're not producing a reflected ray that's visible to your eye. And we'll show you this with some lasers tomorrow. If we talk about diffraction this time, not reflection, but diffraction, it's the bending of waves around an obstacle. Uh, these pictures are pretty good down here. We can look, think of these as walls, right? Now, let's say whatever is producing the noise is producing this nice, consistent wave pattern here. When it hits this hole, it is going to bend around the hole, and 
the sound will begin to be heard from, let's say, here or here. You could do the same, th same thing, let's say this time your wall is kind of incomplete. The light or, or the sound will begin to bend around that. We'll have a demonstration for that also. So reflection was the bouncing of objects. Diffraction is the bending around those objects. And then we have refraction, which is when a wave enters a new medium and changes speed. So in this one, we have to actually enter the medium. And what we'll do is we'll, talk, we'll look at this pencil here. And the pencil starts there. And when it gets in the water, it looks like it's over here. So the pencil looks like it's changed positions or is broken, and we, we all know common sense. It's not at all, but we see this happening. And what's happening is the light waves being produced or bouncing off this pencil are getting to our eyes at different times and at different speeds because water is going to slow down those light waves, whereas air travels very quickly through. So when waves are are deflected, they change from one substance to another. So this results in that slowing down of waves sometimes in here in water when compared to air. And because of that, they're perceived differently. This is why prisms work. What happens here, let's say we have white light entering our prism. When it hits the prism, it begins to separate because the light travels differently through the prism, which is usually made out of some sort of acrylic material or glass or crystal. And then when it exits the prism again, it separates even more because it's now traveling, going back, and it's already been separated within the prism material, going back into air. The light is refracted, and now we can visibly see Roy G. Biv, or the colors of the rainbow that make up white light. This is another reason why if we look into water, okay, so you can see the, the eye here, we may see a fish or something under the, the water, and the fish may be here, but our eyes perceive it here. The reason for that is the light was traveling slowly through this water and then sped up to get to your eye, resulting in what we perceive as the fish being here when it's actually right here. It's the bending of light because it went through a different material the changing of speeds lenses is another way which light can interact with its environment so if we look at lenses we really have two types we have convex lenses or converging lenses which we can call them or we have concave lenses or we can also call them diverging lenses you can see in a convex lens, it takes all of the light rays and focuses it onto one point and produces this image here. In a divergent lens, the light rays into the prism, they're actually spread apart out here, but produce an image on the other side. This is what we call a false image. We can use these for pretty, pretty useful things. But in order to understand that, you have to have a quick kind of anatomy lesson on the eye. The eye itself has this, of course, natural lens, and we call it the lens right here. Now, as, as light enters your eye, this lens is going to take all of that light and focus it right here at this point on the retina, and then eventually the retina will transfer this to the optic nerve, which eventually makes it to our brain, and then we begin to think. Okay? Well, if all of that works well, everything's good, our eye functions nice, we don't need any glasses, but Many times what we see in myopia or nearsightedness is we'll see that image fall short of the retina. Therefore, things seem blurry. In hyperopia or farsightedness, we see things are being focused back here. And because of that, things seem blurry. In order to correct that, what do we do? We very simply put a lens in front of the eye or glasses, which is the same thing, right? Here's our person who's nearsighted. The image was falling short. And what we did was put a concave lens in here, which is going to diver diverge the rays slightly, allowing them to, when they hit this lens, be focused nice right here on the retina. If we look at somebody who um, is farsighted, 
Once again, the image was being formed out here and not on the retina. Put a convex lens, begins to converge them before it hits our, our, our lens, and now we're focused right on the retina, and the optic nerve can transfer that straight to the brain. So, tonight, I'm not asking you to be an expert on any of what we just said. We'll have plenty of discussion tomorrow. But understand the difference between constructive and destructive interference. Understand reflection, diffraction, and refraction. And then have a basic understanding of the two types of concave and convex lenses. Alright, have a good one.